welcome here. Our service is just about to begin, but we wanted to take a moment just to share some insight into why we meet and what these services are all about. We're just a group of regular people. The one thing that we have in common is that each person's life has been radically changed by the love, grace, and sacrifice of Jesus. This experience has moved us to look outside of ourselves and to see a world that is aching for peace and goodness. We feel a deep call to help those around us, following the example He gave. During this time, we come together to remind ourselves of what God has said and how He calls us to live. You're gonna hear about some of the ways we believe Jesus has called us to show up for our community and the world around us. He has taught us to love those the world has called unlovable, forgive what seems unforgivable, and give generously to those who seem undeserving because that is exactly what He did for us. We believe everyone is made to worship, and that simply means showing our adoration and reverence to God. In our services, we do this by singing songs together as a community about God and what He's done for us. Today we'll be opening up the Bible together, which we believe is God's Word and wisdom to us. Our hope is that the message you'll be hearing today will have surprising relevance for the challenges you may be facing personally and for our community. Regardless of who you are or what you believe, this is a space where you can come, ask questions, be yourself, and know that you are loved.
voices because you are worthy. God, we love you. Holy Spirit, would you continue to open our eyes to see the glory of you. God, Father, Spirit, Son. Let's sing together. Let symphonies. Let symphonies resound. Let drums and choirs ring out. Oh, heaven, hear the sound. of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left this throne to work as a child he became like the least of us behold him Jesus Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold Him. He who died. to me. 
vision of who you are, Jesus. And we thank you that it is your work by your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts, to open up our eyes, to see and to receive you today. And so as we sing these words, Holy Spirit, would you work in every person's heart here this morning so that we would see you, Jesus, high and lifted up and we would receive you this morning by your Spirit. Let's sing Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, Messiah. together. God, you are holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God, you are holy and other, and yet you are also present and here in this place, and we worship you. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who lived and died and was raised again and is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And Jesus, we thank you that we can call upon your name and that you save us, that you are present to us, that you are with us. And so Jesus, this morning we want to pray and ask for your work in our community. We particularly ask for those who gather who do not yet know you, those who come to Alpha, the kids in our kids' ministry, the youth who come. We ask, Jesus, that you will reveal yourself to them and draw them to you. God, we know you are at work in this world as well. And today we want to just lift up the Middle East, particularly Israel and Gaza, the peace talks that were going on. God, we ask that you will bring peace. Jesus, you are the Prince of Peace. And so we ask for peace in this region. We ask for protection for vulnerable children. We ask for the hostages to be released. We ask for a way to move forward that honors both people groups. God, be there and be present in that area of the world. And thank you again, Jesus, for the work that you are doing in our community and the work that you're doing in our lives. We are so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. So my name is Marty. I'm one of the pastors here, and I want to give a special welcome to those of you who are guests amongst us, who are just checking out our church. It's so good to have you here. 
And afterwards, if you want, there's a welcome desk at the back. They have a gift for you, and so check that out. As well, this morning, you've hit the right morning. We're having a welcome lunch. So if you're newish to our church, we'd love to have you join us for lunch, and you'll hear from some of the pastors and meet some of the leaders in our church. It'd be great to have you join us. Right now, just turn your attention to the screen for some announcements of some things that are coming up in our church life. Hey CA, my name is Alyssa, and today I'd like to fill you in on some of the events coming up in the life of our church. But before we get started, I wanted to share something. God never intended for us to do life alone. He made us with a desire for deep relational community. And so often we can get busy with work, school, chores, or even Netflix, that we miss out on the rich and beautiful friendships that God intended us for. And so as you watch this video, I invite you to consider how you might find community with other believers here at CA. If you're not sure where to start, that's okay. Consider joining us for Next Step. Next Step is a two-week journey through what it means to be a part of our CA Church family. Whether you wanna join a community group, serve, be baptized, or become a member, this is the best way to get involved. Speaking of membership, we also have our annual general meeting coming up on Sunday, April 28th on Zoom. This is a perfect opportunity to see what goes on behind the scenes at CA Church and to give feedback on how we move forward. This meeting is open to anyone and everyone, and if you're a member, please make sure to register ahead of time so that we can count your votes. Okay everyone, spring is officially here, and that means it's time to retreat. From April 26th to 28th, we will be hosting our men's retreat at Camp Kakala. The theme of this year's men's retreat is simple, but crucial. No man forgotten. We believe that all men need friends, good friends, to thrive, and this is the perfect place to make some new ones. So sign up for this retreat to relax, to have fun, and most importantly, to regain your spiritual mooring. Similarly, our women's retreat is happening on May 24th to 26th at Camp Quanos. During this time, there will be opportunity to reflect, refresh, and renew. Our guest speaker is Dr. Jennifer Singh, and she will speak to us on stories of Jesus' engagement with women in Luke's Gospel. We know that as women, it can sometimes be difficult to get away for a whole weekend retreat. So remember, we also have a women's gathering that will take place every Tuesday from 9.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. beginning on April 9th. This season, through the books of Colossians and Philemon, we will attempt to understand scripture in a fresh new way and discover how we can participate more fully in God's kingdom. Lastly, I wanna remind you about our Tuesday night class. In this weekly class, we will be exploring science and the Bible, do I have to choose? Are science and Christianity really incompatible? As Christians, do we need to choose one or the other? If not, then how do we answer some of the big questions surrounding science and faith, such as how did the universe begin? How do we approach evolution? How do we think about bioethical and biomedical issues such as AI, transhumanism, euthanasia, and genetic modification? This class is in person and on Zoom, and if you still can't make it, no problem. Check out the audio posted each week on our classes podcast. And that's all for today. If you'd like to register for any of these events, the retreats, the classes, the meetings, head on over to cachurch.ca slash events. And remember, none of us were meant to do life alone, and so we look forward to seeing you there. Ooh, that's a lot of things, a lot of things you can get connected to. And I think often when we think of church, we think of a building or a service. But church is the people of God gathered together doing the work of God. And one of the ways that you can contribute is by serving, uh, leading. But another way you can contribute is your finances, trusting God with your tithes and offerings. And so if you just check the, out the screen, you can. there's a giving station at the back, and you can also give online. Thanks again for all the ways you're engaged in our community. And right now, I want to give you an opportunity to just greet each other. And so find someone you haven't met before and say hello. Hey there, thanks for tuning in to CA Church Online. My name is Alyssa and I work in the missions department here at CA. Whether you're joining us live at our Sunday morning service or watching after the fact, welcome. In a few moments, we're going to be diving into this week's message. But while we wait for the greeting time at our Mariner campus to finish, we thought this would be a perfect opportunity for us to say hello and greet all of you watching online as well. CA is an Alliance Church located in Coquitlam, British Columbia, and our mission is to help all people become fully devoted followers of Jesus. We have three campuses spread throughout the Tri-Cities that meet on Sundays, as well as offer ministries that are focused around kids, youth, young adults, missions, and more. 
If you'd like to know about who we are and how you can get involved, we encourage you to visit our website at cachurch.ca. While there, you can also check out our events page to sign up for any upcoming classes or events happening here at the church. Additionally, if you'd like to give financially to CA and support the mission of our church, you can visit the giving page on our website. If you're brand new and joining us today for the first time, we want to meet you. Press the connect button to give us your contact information and someone from CA would love to reach out to you and help you get connected at our church. You can also use this time to quickly like and subscribe to our page here on YouTube. This enables more people to see this video and ensures that you don't miss any. Well, it looks like they're wrapping up in the live service, but once again, thanks for joining us and I hope to see you next week. Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. My name is David. I am one of the pastors here. And this morning, we are beginning a new series. And the series is called The Air We Breathe. Now, I need to warn you. This is really important. I need to warn you. This is an unusual sermon series. Okay? It's, it's, it's unusual from our other sermon series. Uh, in this series, over the next four weeks, we're going to try to make a case. And here's the case that we're going to be making, okay? And it's this. The extraordinary impact of Christianity is seen in the fact that you don't notice it. You may not realize it, but you already hold particularly Christian-ish views. And the fact that you think of these values as natural, obvious, or universal shows how profoundly the Christian revolution has shaped you. So what we're going to be arguing, making a case for, is that uh, the air we breathe, the, the values that we hold, the values that uh, people all throughout this planet hold to be near and dear to their hearts, these values are a product of a revolution that took place 2,000 years ago. They're a product of a person and an event. The person is Jesus Christ, and the event is his life, death, and resurrection. Now, this class, if you uh, are part of my Tuesday night class, you're going to say, this sounds very familiar, David, because we walked through this a couple semesters ago. So... Um, if you're interested, so this will be reviewed for some of you. That's okay. Um, so this is a class that I taught on a Tuesday night. And if you're interested uh, in what I'm saying this morning and you want to hear kind of a longer version of it, you can listen. Um, I did, I think it was close to 10-week series in the fall. And you can find it on Spotify. Yeah. So that's one of many things that Taylor Swift and I hold in common. <laughs> We are both on Spotify. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so this, class, so this series, I mean, there's a number of, of really important books that have come out, especially in recent years, that uh, deal with this topic. But I want to just give you a quick note. This is not a series that is meant to be um, like a form of Christian triumphalism. It's like, you know, Christians have done nothing wrong for 2,000 years. No, we know uh, Christians have done many, and the church have, has done many horrible things in history. But here's the case that I want to make, is that the values that we hold near and dear 
The values that, that we, we think are, are self-evident um, actually are a result of this revolution, this Christian revolution that took place 2,000 years ago. And so we're going to be looking at a few of these values over the weeks. Um, the values we're going to be looking at are equality, humility, freedom. We're going to be looking at science. And so this morning, we're going to begin with equality, the value of equality. And there's two passages that I want to point our attention to. One is found in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. So pretty easy to find right at the beginning of a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, just grab one from the pew rack in front of you. And it's right at the very beginning. And we'll begin with Genesis chapter 1 and begin in verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in, in verse 26. In honor of God's word, let's stand together as I read this. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And there's another passage I just want to point out. And that's found in, in, um, in Galatians chapter 3. And you can just, just listen if you want. Galatians chapter 3, the author Paul, he says this. He says, For as many of you as were baptized in, into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Jesus, we pray that you would speak to us this morning, that you would soften hard hearts and give us eyes to see and ears to hear, um, that we would respond to you. You're not a philosophy, you're not a worldview, but you are personal and you are present with your people here this morning. So we do pray that you would help us to hear what you want to say to us and grant us the courage to respond to you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so we're going to talk about equality. We're going to talk about equality. Now, what, what is this value of equality? Well, it, 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 it has within it a couple ideas. One is that there exists an inherent value in every human being. Every human being has dignity and value. That's one idea. The other idea is that um, there ought to be equality between people. That there ought not to be uh, distinctions which make some people more valuable than others. So there ought to be equality. It was put in within a Christian context is the idea the ground is level at the foot of the cross, but there's equality. Now, you'd be hard-pressed today to find anyone who does not believe in human dignity and equality. And people will say over and over again, we ought to stand up for human rights we ought to defend the equality between every human being, regardless of their age, regardless of their race or their sex or anything, or socioeconomic condition. We need to defend the equality between human beings. And the fact that human beings are equal, we're told, is a self-evident truth. But here's the question I want to ask you. Are these assumptions about value, dignity, and equality really self-evident? Have these values been held to be true throughout the ages, every place, over time? I don't think so. And could it be that this perspective on human nature, the inherent dignity of the human being, and the equality between human beings, could it be that these ideas are not just unusual in history, but they're revolutionary. Now, I want to bring your attention back to an event that took place a number of years ago. I'm not sure if you remember, but um, there was this thing a few years ago um, called COVID. <laughs> Do you remember that? Still too soon? 
Um, during COVID, okay, so during COVID, the dark days of COVID, I came across the story that there was this huge media storm that blew up because of a comment that was made by a leading figure in British society. And the leading figure was, was a, the former UK Supreme Court Justice, a fellow named Lord Sumption. And this is what he said. He says, I don't accept that all lives are of equal value. Now, why does he say this? Well, he says this, um, he was on TV, and he was debating about how effective the government lockdowns were, whether or not government lockdown policies were helpful or not. And he was a critic of the lockdowns. And Lord Sumption argued that seniors were most affected by COVID, but young people were most affected by the lockdowns. And therefore, he reasoned that the lockdown was doing more harm than good. It was, quote, punishing too many for the greater good. So he says this. Now, immediately, everybody kind of jumped on this. And, and they said, you know, hey, what, what are you saying? If, if we don't lock down, you're, you're essentially saying that the older people, the elderly, should be sacrificed for the sake of the young people. And that's what Lord Sumption said. He says, he says, and because he's an older man, he says, my children's and my grandchildren's lives are worth more than mine because they have a lot more of it ahead. Oh, things really blew up. And, and there's one woman, uh, she's, um, she's going through uh, cancer treatments, and this is what she said to Lord Sumption. She says, she says, with all due respect, I am the person who you say their life is not valuable. <laughs> and Lord Sumption in response says, I didn't say your life was not valuable. I, I, I said that it was less valuable. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say that didn't help the situation very much. Everybody was upset. But let's ask the question, why was everybody upset? Well, they're upset because Lord Sumption was suggesting the unthinkable. He was suggesting that the young were more valuable than the elderly and that those who are healthy are more valuable than the sick. And so the, can the cancer patient, in response to Lord Sumption's clarification, this is what she said. She says, who are you to put a value on life? In my view, and I think in many others, Life is sacred. And I don't think we should be making those judgment calls. All life is worth saving, regardless of what life it is people are living. Now, it's interesting what she says. Because she's coming come, you know, from a secular background. But immediately, what does she say? She says, all life is valuable. Because all life is, what word does she use? Sacred, which is, in, which is a, a religiously charged word. And she's saying that even though we live in a, a world where God is all being but eclipsed, where religion has been privatized and relativized, what does she say? She says, don't you, how can you suggest this? Don't you recognize that all life is sacred? And even in our secular world today, if you deny the inherent equality between people, people say, ah, oh, that's... <laughs> Sacrilegious. <laughs> no, but the question is why? Why is the equality between human beings seen as natural and self-evident? And why, why is the inequality of worth between human beings seen as so wrong? Why is treating the elderly and the sick as being less valuable than the healthy and the young, why is that seen as wrong? Why should laws protect the weak and the vulnerable? Why should there be laws to protect the weak and the vulnerable? Now, to answer this question, I want you to come with me in a time machine. And we're going to go back to the Greco-Roman world of the first century. You going to come with me? Okay, this will be fun. Now, first thing you need to realize is that these ideas of human equality 
would have struck Greek and Roman thinkers as absolutely crazy. It's just strange. I mean, if you read the writings of Aristotle or Cicero, in, 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 in the pagan culture, there's no appeal to universal brotherhood of man or universal sisterhood. In fact, in the Greco-Roman world, you don't find a whole lot of concern for the weak and the vulnerable. To be weak, to be vulnerable, well, that was their fault. They're in, in life, there's winners and there's losers. That's what the Greeks and the Romans would say. And this idea of equality between people was an absurdity. One Greek historian says, he says this, he says, the strong do as they wish, and the weak must suffer what they must. That's just the way things are. In fact, if we were on our time machine, and if we wanted to, we could bring uh, a famous philosopher back to C.A. Church. So we, we bring back Plato, and we bring him here this morning into our sanctuary, and I could interview Plato for you. And I'd bring up questions about equality between people. And I'd ask him, and so what would Plato say? If I quoted to Plato what Lord Sumption said, you know, which is that some lives are worth more than others, what would Plato say? Well, you would say, and it would be in Greek, but something along the lines of, um, well, duh. <laughs> he said, well, duh. Of course people are unequal. He would say, well, think about it. Of course people are unequal. Look at our society. I'll tell you right now, you look at society. There's men and women. And Plato would say, right away, you can see there's inequality. You're telling me that women should be equal to men? Are you kidding me? Do you know what women are, Plato would say? <laughs> Just to be clear, this is Plato saying it. <laughs> I'm listening to him, Plato saying this. Plato would say, do you know what women are? Women are like unripe fruit. They're like deformed men. Now, how these guys got girlfriends is beyond me, but <laughs> that, that's what he said. That's what he would say. Women are soft. They're like fruit that hasn't, haven't ripened yet. So obviously there's inequality between men and women. That's obvious. But yeah, okay, maybe among the Greeks we could all be the, similar, but even then. But you think about it in a society, you're talking about equality. One third of our society, he would say to us, one third of society in the Greco-Roman world are made up of slaves. Are you telling me that slaves are equal to the Greeks? How could they be equal? Slaves aren't people. They're tools. They're living tools. So how could a hammer be of equal value to the one who wields the hammer? Because it's impossible. Of course there's inequality. And then Plato, because he's cheeky, he would turn the question on you. He would look at you and, and he would say, okay, all right. Tell me, barbarian Canadians, how do you arrive at this preposterous idea that all people are equal? Where do you get this idea from? What magical realm are you drawing from where people are seen as equally valuable? Where do you get this from? By observation? No, not a lot of evidence for this. Where do you get this idea? I can see that you're upset when I talk about women, I talk about slaves and things like that. But why? Why are you so upset? Where does this idea of equality come from? There's no evidence in history. Observe humanity, he would tell us. It's clear. Some people are more capable than others. And so some people are worth more than others. Now, my guess is that most of you here this morning, you hear this, and you would have a gut reaction to what Plato is saying. The question I want to linger on is that deep reaction we feel inside. Why do we feel this gut reaction? Why do we react when somebody says one group is more valuable than others, or one race is more valuable than other races? 
particular socioeconomic classes are more important and more valuable than others. Why do we react to this? Well, we react because whether you know it or not, we have inherited a biblical understanding of what it means to be a human being. We have inherited a biblical view of the human being. So what is the biblical view of a human being? Well, how does the Bible begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So right away, we find God who creates, who brings order out of chaos. He's very different from the Greco-Roman gods who are busy raping and killing. What we find in the Bible is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is good, who is loving, and who created humanity uniquely. We read in the book of Genesis that God, again, he speaks order out of chaos. Darkness flees. Light shines in the darkness. And then we get this beautiful picture of creation. And in this picture of creation, you get artistry. You get poetry. You get beauty. And then the pinnacle of creation, the pinnacle of creation, the very highest point is the creation of humanity where God creates humanity in his image and he steps back and he says, this is very good, very good. The pinnacle of creation is the creation of humanity. And so what are these human beings? Well, they're not slaves to some fickle gods. That's how other creation narratives went. But humanity is created to reign to rule, to steward God's good creation. As men and women, we are stamped with God's image. And we are commissioned to live as vice regents over God's good creation. This is a biblical story. Now, if you went to your neighbor, you know, at your home or whatever, you talk to your neighbor and say, you know, the Bible says this is who human beings are. They might roll their eyes. Oh, you know, you believe in those things. But here's the thing. If you're living in the first century and you lay that vision out, people would roll their eyes or, or whatever they would do in the first century to express contempt. They would say, are you crazy? Human beings are valuable? In the Greco-Roman world, human beings are supposed to serve the gods. Human beings are, okay, and, 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 and if you lay this out, they might say, this is crazy. I get it. Maybe a king should rule things. But you're saying just two human beings? They have names, Adam, <laughs> Eve. A woman? A woman is given the commission to be a good steward over all creation? Are you crazy? But that's what we read in Scripture. You see, the criticism that's often levied against Christianity from ancient times, even to modern times, is that Christianity is, is too human-centered. It elevates human beings too much. It makes human beings too important. We've been given too special of a place in, in God's creation. But here's the point I want to make. The inherent value of every human being is the fact that every human being is made in God's image. And the fact that we are made in God's image and have dignity and value, that is the very foundation for human rights. The modern notion of human rights and equality is rooted in the imago Dei, the image of God. So let me ask you this question. If you remove the Imago Dei, if you remove our connection to God and God's creation of us and putting dignity and value into us, if you remove that, on what basis is a human being valuable? On what basis is a human being valuable if you remove the Imago Dei, the image of Godness, the fact that we're created by God? Without God's story of humanity, 
Where do we find this idea of equality and value among human beings? Without God's story, it's really, really hard to make a case for the value of a human being. In fact, the only way you could make a human being value, valuable is to say they are valuable because they are useful. You have, to, you have to rely on utility. When you remove the Imago Dei, all you have left is utility. How useful are you? And the, you know what? That's actually how the ancient world saw human beings. The pagan world was quite reasonable when it came to assessing human value. So they would look at children. they say, well, children obviously are less valuable. Um, and so there was a practice in the Greco-Roman world, which today we would call eugenics. They bred very carefully. And the children born in a family were, were valued by their usefulness. Utility was a key factor in determining whether or not a baby should live. And so in Roman society, I don't know if you know this, but in Roman society, abortion and infanticide were commonplace. In fact, abortion and infanticide, killing a baby, was very common um, among all people groups except for the Jews. Every other nation or empire, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Greeks, the Romans, these guys regularly killed their babies. And you were killed. The baby was killed. Why? Because they were seen as useless. Now, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to what our Roman philosopher Seneca has to say. He says this. He says, we knock mad dogs on the head. We slaughter fierce and savage bulls. We doom scabby sheep to the knife, lest they should infect our flocks. We destroy monstrous births. And we also drown our children if they are born weakly or unnaturally formed. To separate what is useless from what is sound is an act, not of anger, but of reason. This is an act of reason. It's not debated in the ancient world. And so what particular group of people were seen as most useless were, were, were baby girls, honestly. Daughters were seen as costly in the Roman Empire, and so they were either married off at the age of 11 or 12, but many were killed at birth. And do you know, in the Greco-Roman world, to kill a baby girl was not a crime. You couldn't kill a baby boy if he was healthy. If the baby boy was deformed, then you could kill it. Kill him. But baby girls... Yeah, I mean, it, it happened all the time. And so what would happen is, a, 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 you know, a baby girl would be born, and, and, and this baby girl wasn't a human being until the head of the family, the paterfamilias, the head of the family, comes along and looks at the baby and says yes or no. And so if he looks at the baby girl and says yes, she gets to live. If he looks at her and says no, then she was thrown out. Or drowned. Again, Seneca puts it this way. What is good must be set apart from what is good for nothing. So these one guys put it this way. They say, they say this. The non-persons who are left on the floor while their mothers watch from their birthing chairs, they would be drowned immediately in a bucket of water or brought to the town dump to be exposed to wild dogs and vultures. If they survive for any considerable time there, they might be rescued by pimps and raised as child prostitutes. It was all legal, above board. It was the right thing to do, as any reasonable and well-adjusted pagan philosopher will tell you. I told you this is a different kind of sermon series, right? <laughs> so we come back to our own situation. When we remove the foundation of God's story for humanity, when we remove the Imago Dei, when we remove the dignity and value he gives us by stamping his image upon us, when all this is removed, what are we left with? Utility. How useful we are determines our value as human beings. Now let's get a little awkward. 
How useful are the weak, the vulnerable, and the elderly in Canada? Well, increasingly, they're seen as, as, as not very valuable at all, as all, at all. And so how do we, if, if, if someone who's a senior citizen, if someone is, 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 is elderly and they're struggling with depression, how do we treat that depression? What do we offer them? Yeah, we, we, we offer to kill them through medical assistance and dying. Do we offer counseling? No, no, because that, you know, that might be pricey. So how do we help those who may be suicidal? How do we help those who, who, who have all sorts of issues, who are vulnerable? Well, increasingly, we offer to kill them because they're not useful. And we treat those who are not useful as being expendable. You, you see what happens when you lose the Imago Dei, when you, when you lose the God story of our dignity and our equality, then your dignity and your value is based on utility and old people aren't useful. I'm getting old and I'm feeling use more and more useless. <laughs> Do you know last year, over 10,000 Canadians were killed by MAID? It was up 35% from two years earlier. Over 10,000. California, with the same population, also with euthanasia laws, 300 people died. Canada, over 10,000. And it's just... Now, the biblical story says this. It doesn't matter who you are. You are made in the image of God and you have dignity and value and equality and that is the truth. Your value is not determined by how useful you are. Your value is, 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 is freely given as a gift. Simply by being a human being, you have value. And I'll tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we need to start speaking this loudly. This is so important. Now, let, let me leave you with, with, with another, another fun story from history. Now, you can see why I like this series, right? Because I get to do a lot of history stuff, right? Um, I, I read that not long ago, some archaeologists were doing a study of um, burial, where, where, where Christians were buried in the Roman Empire. And do, do you know where Christians were, all, were often buried? In the, in the first century, in the second century? Where were they buried? In, in, they're called the catacombs, right? They're underground, under the cities. And so they did a study, and they looked at all the Christians who were buried, and you know what they studied? They studied their names. And they, and they realize, as they're studying the names of these people who had died, that they found three categories of names. One category is people who, when they died, they kept, they, they, they're throughout their whole life, they had a Roman name, and they just kept their Roman name. That's one category. The other category are people who changed their names, and they took the names of, of some of the biblical writers um, or, or some of the biblical characters or martyrs. And so you have, you have names like... Um, you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Mary, you know, those sorts of names. But there's a third category. There's a third category of names that's really interesting. And this third category of names, the names are really strange. They're humiliating names. Or they're strange names. So, so uh, some Christians chose to bear the name of um, um, Projectus. Pro, projectus, <laughs> that's the way you pronounce it. It's where we get, it's an interesting word. It's where we get the word projectile or project or to throw, to toss. And the word, the name means to throw out, to throw in the trash. That's what the name means. So some guy has a name which means to throw in the trash. 
Another two names, you have a name like Stercorius and a Greek name, Coprion. And they, if you translate those names, it's, it's kind of gross. <laughs> They're kind of gross names. What they basically mean is a dung heap or excrement. That's what the name means. So why would somebody go through their whole life being called excrement or dung heap? Like, you imagine at school, that would be awkward. Hey, dung heap, uh, you know, have you finished your assignment? Hey, you know, excrement. You know, they're just weird names, but people held on to these names. Your name means trash. Now, why did they have these names? I think they kept these names because they knew their story. Because while the Romans were throwing out all the babies onto the street, into the junk, into the dung heaps and all sorts of things, while the Romans were throwing out baby girls in particular, the early church went door to door to door to door, place to place to place, and gathered up all these babies and rescued them and raised them. Why? Because they're made in the image of God. And these kids grew up knowing, hey, I was thrown out into a dung heap. But now I belong to Jesus. And what they knew, and this is something we need to get our heads around, what they knew is, is what, what the world saw as excrement, God saw as precious. What the world sees as excrement, God sees as precious. Because each person has dignity and value because God made them so. You see, the story, God's story of, the, of every human being, the, the, these, the, they go together. Human rights, human rights cannot stand for long without the Imago Dei. We are living in the shadow of Christianity. The problem is, is a shadow casts no shadow. And so this morning, if you're here this morning, regardless of their mental capacity, the color of their skin, their socioeconomic background, age or health, then if you believe this, whether or not you realize it, you're actually embracing the biblical story. This is the air we breathe. This is a result of a revolution that took place 2,000 years ago with a person and event. The person is Jesus Christ, and the event is his life, death, and resurrection. And this reality has changed history. It's changed the world for good. And it can continue to change the world for good. Does that make sense? It's a different kind of sermon series. <laughs> well, we're going to respond to this by taking communion together. Now, let me, can I tell you one more geeky story? Just kind of fun story. It's, again, it's from history. That's why I linger, right? Um, imagine for a moment. Imagine for a moment. Like in the Roman world, one-third of you would be slaves. One-third of you. There's a high population of slaves. Now, if you're a slave and you're a woman, <laughs> things aren't looking very good for you, right? It's pretty, it's hard not to be a slave, but if you're a female slave, it's even, now imagine your life and how miserable it is. You're not even a human being. And all week long, you're treated like rubbish. You're treated like garbage. You're abused, you're just thrown around, you're, you're nothing. But Sunday morning, you enter into a home, and you're sitting next to people, and the person next to you is a Roman emperor, or not a Roman emperor, maybe a Roman senator. Somebody pretty high up that everybody sees, sees as valuable. But this senator looks at you, and you look at him, and you call each other by name. And, and, and he looks to you and he treats you with dignity and value and you treat the same way because you both know something profoundly important and that is the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And can you imagine when they pass you the bread and you take the bread and, you, and, and he says to you and he calls you by name and you take that bread and I belong to Jesus and you give it back and, and you say, can you imagine how, what a revolutionary idea that would be? 
You'd want to shout that from the rooftops, wouldn't you? It turns the world upside down. And this is what we're invited into. Now, we're carrying on in that story. We're taking ordinary bread, ordinary juice with extraordinary meaning. So invite our communion service to come forward at this point. The, the bread represents the body of Jesus. It means we belong to Jesus, that we have dignity and value. We belong to Jesus. We're stamped with the Imago Dei. And, and that Jesus is our leader. He's our forgiver. He's our Lord and our Savior. And when we take the bread, we're saying we belong to Jesus. And then when we take the juice, we're saying we belong to Jesus, not because of anything we bring to the table, not because we're high-born or anything like that, but because of Jesus' shed blood for all of us. He died the death that we should have died. And so when you take the bread, take the juice, you receive God's incredible grace into your life. And so if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, doesn't matter what church you're from, this is the Lord's table, hey, come, come and take part. Some of you were not followers of Jesus Christ until now. <laughs> and you're like, I want in. Hey, take the bread, take the juice, and say to Jesus, I want in. And some of you here this morning, you're like, I'm still not there yet, David. I'm still not there yet. Well, that's okay. Just let the bread and the juice go by, but take Alpha, which starts on Wednesday, right? And learn more about this. So let me pray, and then we'll, die, and then we'll, and we'll follow these instructions, and we'll go from here. But let's pray. Jesus, we come before you recognizing that we are completely dependent upon you. Thank you for life. Thank you that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That every human being has been marked with the image of God and has dignity and value. We thank you, Lord, that you have rescued us out of our sins. Because that's also part of the story that we have wandered away from you and we've tried to be God in our own life. And so we come back to you recognizing our lives will only work insofar as they're aligned to you, the author of life. And so we take this bread and we're reminded that we belong to you. We are the church. And we take this juice and we recognize that we, are, uh, we belong to you because of your amazing grace. And then grant us courage to go out into the world and proclaim the hope that comes from knowing and being known by you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
to the weak you care for the widow and the orphaned forever Lord what you reign what joy what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord what peace what peace for those whose confidence is him alone what joy what joy for those whose hope is in the name of the Lord. What peace, what peace for those whose confidence is him alone. Now, just before uh, you leave this morning, um, some of you may need to spend some time in prayer. And so I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward at this point and just take your, take your places. And these are people that you can trust and they'd be happy to pray with you. So if God is stirring in your hearts to respond in whatever way, um, come spend some time in prayer. If you want to pray on your own with a friend in the pew, that's fine. But if you want someone to pray with, um, you can pray, pray with Aldo. No, is there somebody else? <laughs> As many, if there's elders or whoever, um, come forward at this point. Yes. There we go. Let me leave you with a, a vision that um, was given to a guy named John, who's a follower of Jesus. And uh, John is on basically Alcatraz at this point. He's on this island of Patmos. And Jesus gives him this vision. It's an incredible vision. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, which is Jesus. And all the angels were standing around the throne and, and, and around the elders and the, and, and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Go in his grace. Amen. <laughs>